Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right, welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim, and our guest today is Charles. So, Charles, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you live and what you do for a living. Okay, uh, again, my name is Charles Edwards. I'm located in Lafayette, Louisiana. I am the CEO and founder of a company called One Telemed, uh, and we serve as the telepsychiatry provider for a number of the Louisiana Medicaid MCOs, and we provide um, outpatient uh, psychiatric uh, services. Uh, medication management, as well as counseling services uh, to individuals across Louisiana, specifically underserved communities. So do you mind sharing kind of what telepsychiatry is? I think that many people don't really fully understand like the depth of what that means. Um, it's basically using uh, technology that gives you the opportunity to get access to care using um, smart devices, laptops, uh, so more so seeing the doctor over the screen. So some people log in from phones, iPhones, Androids, anything that has a screen with a camera and internet service, they can gain access in our tablet, our internet services. And so what happens, uh, it gives you the ability to receive the same um, kind of services that you would receive if you were walking into a doctor's office. You can basically get it from the comfort of your own home. Makes sense. So can you just talk more about what a typical customer looks like? Like, who is your ideal customer and how do you exactly serve them? So it's kind of twofold. We have a couple of different models. Um, one of our models is where we directly contract with insurance companies to provide services to their members. Um, because we have extremely um, low wait times, um, it gives them the ability to uh, refer their, their members over to us and then we can actually schedule an appointment to see any member that may be suffering from a mental illness, um, experiencing some signs of a mental illness. And so we can take it from an assessment state all the way to seeing one of our practitioners. So anyone that's um, think they may be dealing with uh, any type of depression or an anxiety, some people with ADHD, kids, adults, um, all ages really. And so and then we also have a school-based model where we actually provide um, services inside of the school. So we partner up with school districts and we provide those medication management counseling services inside of the school. So any school district that is having problems getting access to care for their, their, their students, um, that's people that we can partner up with. And so, and then we also have... Um, like clinics that we work with. So rural health clinics, um, FQHCs, primary care physicians that have a, a large percentage of their population that may suffer from a mental illness and they don't want to be responsible for doing the medications management services they can refer. We can partner with them and provide services directly to their members. Are there their clients inside that office or their clients can be referred to us from home? Makes sense. So are all of your, I guess, customers in a sense B2B, like you're only working with organizations and then they essentially will place their clientele in front of your business, right? Yeah, we, we do a lot of we do a lot of B2B side. We do some we don't do a lot of marketing to the community in a sense. And it's for the, a, a special reason. We don't really want to compete and take business from other local providers. Um, so our our job is not to, our responsibility is not to take business from people. We're, we're really focused on bringing access to care where people normally don't have access. So we typically go through an insurance companies or go through clinics or schools. Uh, that way we can provide services so we don't disrupt the local market and disrupt the local businesses because we want to keep those thriving as well. That's awesome. So what would you say is like the biggest challenge that you face in the business today? Gosh, for me, I'm in a very unique place, right? I am, we're growing faster than what we can not say we can keep up with, right? We're we're growing right now out of leaps and bounds. Um, I just recently, I'm in the process of negotiating a national contract with a major player. So I have to hire a lot more providers. The, I think the biggest problem for me is looking for the banking side, right? The supporters. I own 100% of the company. I don't have investors. So everything is kind of bootstrapping it for me. And so right now we're in a, a very large expansion project, right? And to find 
strategic partners from a banking perspective that will assist with helping us grow. Because the problem is, I think the biggest problem is as a provider, healthcare provider, we have to go through the same lending process as somebody who wants to open a restaurant or a bar or some other type of business that may not be providing an essential need. And so that makes it very difficult sometimes. And then all the other thing is also finding staff finding licensed personnel that can actually help in with the, with the right heart, not just anybody, but with the right heart to really serve people. Because again, we're focused on underserved communities. So a lot of the people that we serve are below the income, um, or below the income uh, bracket, right? They're low, they're low income. So it's, it's, you have to really have a special heart for that population because you have to take in consideration all the external stimuli that affect them emotionally as well. So, so those are the two biggest things I would say uh, uh, that is the thorn in my side. Yeah. And this industry finding staff is actually a very common one. And I think, I don't know if you guys have the same challenge, but a big challenge I've seen is that when you're working with these certain you know organizations or if the government's helping pay for it, there's a limit on how much you can pay your staff because you're getting certain reimbursements. So it's hard to find staff that'll work for X salary that are good quality people, as you said, that are really like good hearted, that really will just want to do this because you have a limit as to how much you can pay them and still so- keep your business afloat. Right. Right. Yeah. And and because we majority, 98 percent of the population that we serve is Medicaid. Medicaid is probably the lowest reimbursement reimbursement government insurance in the country. Right. And so, yeah, having support staff, having the providers, being able to keep the building, the lights, technology, all that stuff. And then we're, we're it's and then having to balance all that um, and make it work. You're right. It's, it's, it's tough. But I've been really I've been really fortunate, really blessed to be able to get people who really believe in the vision and the purpose of what we're doing. And so it's been great. Um, I'm starting to feel it a little bit more now because we're starting to expand out in different states. And so it's yeah. like, uh, but it's going to happen. It just takes a little bit more time, but it will work. So in terms of like finding these people, what does a hiring process look like for you? They initially go, they go through three rounds of interviewing. So um, normally they'll send over their resume or in some cases their CV. And, um, and then we go over it. And list, they send background checks or like their references. So we usually check references prior to interviewing. Um, so that way we'll have an understanding of that person's personality. And so they do an initial interview where we go over the mission, the culture, um, and just uh, overall the overall value of the company and what we believe and what we're uh, hoping to uh, accomplish. Not hoping to, but accomplishing and create and sense, make sure it's they they feel the same, like if their heart is in the same place. And then if once we explain to them the business model, where we are in our mission, if they're a good fit, then we usually refer them. We usually connect them to the second interview view is usually with um, my HR person. So they go through all those HR questions and the three star and five star uh, um, ratings. And then once they do that, they they're go to the specific department. So if it's a clinical, they meet with uh, the clinical supervisor, or medical director, um, and they interview there. And then that's where the decision is usually made. So typically, like, like if you bring somebody on, would they be sitting and working directly with one of these facilities? Let's just say that you're working with a school. They'd be sitting and working with that school only. Or do you have them go from school to school in the area? Like, what does that typically look like for somebody? Um, they all work in remote. So our providers all work remote. So they work from okay. home and they log into a computer like we're doing now. Um, and they're actually um, seeing patients there. So normally what happens is they, they will work depending on how big the school system is. So we have one school system that's 12 schools. If, if there's enough patients that are coming that are referred through them for have multiple days, then they will only be assigned to that particular school. Uh, so that's what we normally do. We like to keep and the good thing about it is they see the same patients. So one of the things about us as a telemedicine company, uh, continuity of care is important. So we function as a doctor's office. We don't we don't function like a lot of the bigger companies, national companies, where you log in, you see a provider and then you log in again, you see somebody differently. So they always have the same patients every time um, so they can build a relationship and walk through life with them. And I think that's the one of the key things that helps us to be effect- effective um, with our outcomes because we have a relationship with our patients. So yes, in most cases, they will stay at that one school and then they will on that day, like for instance, they may have Tuesday and Thursdays, they may have that one school. And then the other days they're assigned to other places where they can actually see uh, the clients. So for example, like if a student's working with one of your providers, would they like go to like a separate room and then take a Zoom call essentially with that provider in a one-on-one basis? 
Mm -hmm. So the um the, the school designates an area, a specific area where they actually provide services. And then we then the provider logs in through a device and actually provides services one on one with them. There is a uh, there is a staff member from the school, usually a counselor or a nurse that's um, within eye distance of the uh, the session, just in case there's an emergency, then we have be able to contact. Um, so we'll have a cell phone number. So our, or they may be somewhere in the same room where they can hear. And so if there's an opportunity or emergency, we're able to contact that person so they can come in and um, assist if there's an emergency or um, just basically call their name and get their attention. So. For sure. And I think that what you're doing is very new. It's like sort of like you know, innovative and you've probably gotten some pushback from people who are like, this doesn't work. It needs to be in person. So how do you like overcome those yeah. objections from people who do push back on your services? Oh man, that journey, man. So I, <laughs> so I started telemedicine back in 2013. So in Louisiana, we were really the first telemedicine provider and I spearheaded the telemedicine movement in Louisiana. And trust me, it was like, this ain't gonna work, man. You crazy, bro. Not not people not gonna want to see a doctor over a screen. This is not effective. Uh, and then I think um, something crazy happened. This thing called COVID, right? Happened and everything shut down. And guess what happened? Everybody had to go see the doctor telemedicine now. So I went from being the weird dude that came up with this idea to like, man, you're smart. Like who would ever who ever thought, you know? And uh, so it opened a lot of doors. But I think that was the bigger the changing point for telemedicine. When when COVID hit, there was no other options. And I think when people realized there was no other options, they had to see the doctor via telemed and it became part of their norm. So uh, you find more people now utilizing telemedicine than ever because they realize that they can get the same services from the convenience of their home, from their smartphone, from their computer and their iPad. They don't have to deal with traffic. They don't have to spend money on gas. They don't have to go sit in the doctor's office. They can sit, sit at home and, and just wait till their turn to see the doctor. So I think that opened the eyes for a lot of people in making medicine more convenient and more efficient for them to be able to get services and access to care in a more timely manner. So did you like, essentially acquire lots of clientele during COVID and then those clients, I guess, are still sticky and are still working with you after, you know, COVID happened, right? Well, most, most people think COVID helped me, right? COVID really, so before COVID, we were the wow company. We were like, oh, we're the telemedicine company. <laughs> Nobody else is doing telemedicine but us. Right. So we were the company everybody was talking about. But when COVID hit, everybody became our competitor. Right. right. So then I had to start pivoting to figure out what's the next stage and what telemedicine is going to look like and right. what it should be. Right. Or, or where it's going. So I think because I'd already was in the in the market and already doing services, I was always steps ahead of the market. Correct. Um, so during COVID, I did something kind of crazy, man. And we, we're going to be launching it soon. So I can't give too many details about it because we're going to be launching it soon. But right. I actually um, ended up inventing a wearable telemedicine device. Um, so where you can get all your vitals and you can actually see the doctor directly from the device. So we're finally like just finished prototype. Um, we just finished prototyping it and getting into final design. Uh, we started beta testing in a couple of months. And so we're, we're looking forward to hitting the market sometime next year, roughly around this time. And that will really change the game of how telemedicine really works because we can really get um, in like visits. So we'll be able to see what's going on with the patient. We'll be able to monitor the patient. So I think it will take telemedicine to a whole nother level that we haven't seen before. For sure. I mean, and just to your point, right, you had the insights and industry knowledge. I mean, somebody can't just start and pick up from scratch and say, okay, I'm going to do telemedicine when you've already been doing it since 2013, right? So you already kind of, as you said, right, you were several steps ahead of somebody who's just doing it like out of desperation. Like you already have the infrastructure in the system and you know how to operate. It was just a matter of, I guess, getting in front of more people with your services. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing about it is I still feel like there's gaps because telemedicine is a new industry. And because of it, a lot of people are getting into it. And I feel like it it still needs some change, right? Because for most people, they can get online, see a doctor, say, I have a fever. And they're not necessarily sick. So you don't actually have access to patient's vitals and able to see if that person is really sick, like you're going to the hospital. Um, I think that's the part where telemedicine can change. Um, how do you verify that the person is really feeling the way they're feeling? And this is the device, this device here will actually give us that opportunity to be able to treat it like a more in-like visit, in-person visit, so that um, so that telemedicine won't be used ineffectively in a wrong way. Um, 
um, because it, in some cases, it opens the door for people who are seeking um, opioids, seeking other medications that they don't necessarily need. Uh, a lot of medication that may have some street value. Um, and a lot of those cases, it's easier for a patient to get online and request those and they're getting sent because there's no systems in place to really guard that. But doing it the way that we do it really minimize those risks for our providers and minimize the risk um, for the patient's health because we're able to have access to those patients. So we see a patient's blood pressure is high. They say my blood pressure is high. Then we see it because we have access to those vitals. Um, so we're, we're, we're really bringing a different approach to what telemedicine should be versus what it is now. A hundred percent. So obviously now everybody's looking at use cases for things like AI, right? So do you feel like AI has a use case in your business? And if so, what would that be? Um, so in a sense for my wearable, um, we actually are building a health AI that um, helps helps people keep live healthier and have better lives. So I think there's some ways that we can utilize uh, technology, especially AI, AI, to help build uh, protocols that will help. And specifically, so specifically with the wearable that we have, AIs that can help pr predict panic attacks and be able to preventative medicine versus just being proact uh, reactive. So the AI that we're currently building right now will allow us to be proactive because we're able to detect a lot of the major illnesses prior to them happening because if the person is wearing it constantly, the device gets smarter and understands the person's body and then can, can help kind of predict it, especially because we have movement. So if you have a person that's starting to have shakes and Parkinson's, we can start detecting that a little bit earlier. So that's all AI generated. So um, I think there's a lot of room for it. But there's we have some really cutting edge technology that's going to hit the market. I think that a lot of people will be excited about. But do you think that AI could help you like in conversational AI for like appointment booking and oh, people absolutely. seeking out more information? Oh, absolutely. That definitely automates systems where you can minimize the amount of back end work that you do. We're going to get to that point, too. Uh and, and that's that's something we're looking more into is how do we automate systems to where when people are trying to schedule appointments, we have AI, AI available to be able to assist with scheduling and rescheduling appointments. And um, so, yeah, that's definitely something. There's definitely a lot of room for that. And specifically for people who are looking for information about the business and services, um, having that component is going to be very key for us. For sure. So what would you say is like the one biggest piece of advice that you wish you knew before you started this business? Oh gosh. Um, piece of advice. Well, I would pay, I would say I always tell people this and I had to learn this the hard way. It's not always about being the smartest person in the room, it's about being the most fearless, right? Um, that means um, believing in your dream to the point where you never have a, a thought of quitting. Because when you have a thought of quitting, the, the battle is not between you and the person outside of you, it's the person on the inside of you. It's like getting to a place where you are solely convinced that whatever your dreams are, they will work and manifest without any doubt, right? I think I believed in my dreams, but a lot of the times I was my biggest critic. And because I was my biggest critic, I held myself back from walking in through opp to opportunities that uh, could have gotten me further along. Um, and it's not until I realized that I was my biggest critic and I had to convince me that it was going to work and not wait for anybody else to validate me from a business perspective. Um, that's when I was able to walk through a lot of doors and really get to a place in business where I'm growing and continuing to grow and where there's no, I used to say, people used to say the sky's the limit, where there's no limit to the opportunities that you can achieve and manifest in your life. That's awesome. So if we're going to have this conversation again in one year from now, where do you see things going for your business? Oh, gosh, man. Uh, I think I would almost start change myself because I don't, It's I've taken that part where I, I know we're going to be national, right? Because we're already working on a national deal right now that will put us in about 19 different states. We are working, also working on some international projects, so we'll be international. My um, my medical device will be on the market and changing people and helping people all over the world. I will probably be a thousand times more, as from, a, from an employee perspective, probably I can't say triple, quadruple, so it's probably a thousand times bigger than where I am now. Um, because with these projects, we have the number of people that we will have to bring on as staff and the jobs that we'll create in our local community is just amazing. So um, I would probably be in a place, really, to be honest with you, Dan, a place that I wouldn't even recognize myself because... It's like, man, I never thought in a million years when I started this business in uh, 2013 in my spare bedroom in my garage that I would be able to be in a position where 
are making a difference in so many people's lives. That's awesome. And Charles, we're rooting for you. So if somebody watching this wanted to reach out, do you mind sharing your website or social media handle? Just best way for somebody to get in contact with you. Definitely can visit my website at www.onetelemed.com, O-N-E-T-E-L-E-M-E-D.com. And that would basically get you everything you need, get you connected to me, my staff, and every, the support you need, get you access to appointments, information about our business. So that would be the best way to really get connected to us. Awesome. Well, Charles, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity. Of course. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.